After decades at war, the U.S. and its allies called it quits, leaving the Taliban in charge. And if there's a set of images that best capture how Afghans reacted to the Taliban takeover, it is these. Desperate people clinging onto a U.S. military plane as it departs Kabul airport. Images from the 16th of August, the day after the Taliban entered Kabul. The city's airport would go on to see worse scenes of death and hopelessness as people struggled to leave the country. All of this leading to inevitable finger-pointing at the United States for, quote, abandoning Afghans. President Joe Biden would have none of that. American troops cannot and should not be fighting in a war and dying in a war that Afghan forces are not willing to fight for themselves. Now, there is some truth to that. While many brave Afghan soldiers did fight, thousands did surrender to the Taliban. For Afghans, of course, that meant dealing with the Taliban they feared would exact revenge on people who worked for Western nations. Thousands camped out in muck and waste outside Kabul airport, hoping to be airlifted. A suicide bomb killed more than 100. And just hours before the August 31st deadline, the last U.S. soldier boarded the last military plane out, leaving the Taliban fully in charge. Now, Ali Latifi is one of many who was there as the Taliban took over. He's an Afghan journalist whom I've spoken with over the years about developments in Afghanistan. He's in Doha now, and I reached out to him to ask what it was like in Kabul in those weeks of transition. We, to, to be quite honest, everyone thought that, you know, the day the Taliban would come, the world would end, that there would be, you know, mass killings on the street, blood everywhere, that, you know, it would essentially be like an Armageddon. Um, and luckily, it didn't turn out that way. You know, uh, the, there was a lot of fear, especially like the day on August 15th, when there were rumors that the Taliban were coming into the city. You know, I was out in a very um, busy, highly trafficked area of the city going to meet a friend uh, for lunch when, you know, I just saw hundreds of people just running in each direction. It looked like a disaster movie. And, you know, I, it was the last time I had my headphones on on the streets of Kabul. I take off my headphones and I'm like, what's going on? And people are saying the Taliban are coming, the Taliban are coming. And everybody was just running, screaming, like just trying to get into cars, trying to get away, um, just panicking. It turned out that it was a completely false alarm. And, you know, they didn't end up coming until the middle of the night. But that was the level of fear going into it. And mm -hmm. then the initial days after they actually took over and they could be seen everywhere on the streets of Kabul, you know, the streets were very empty. People were afraid to go out. They didn't know how to behave. They didn't know how the Taliban would react. Uh, you know, there was no economy. Most, most stores, most restaurants, most businesses were all closed. Offices were closed. So not a lot of people were going out. Um, and then slowly, you know, like more and more people started going out, more and more women, although to, to be fair, you know, to this day, there's there's a lot fewer women out on the streets of major cities, including Kabul, than there would have been in years past and right. even five, six months ago. Um, but now what's happened is that the biggest issue for people is that there's no money. There's no money anywhere. And, you know, Afghanistan is an entirely cash-based society. Right. It's the kind of place where if you don't have physical money, you don't eat. And that has become the reality for everybody in the country now. You know, even if yeah. you were, you and, know, a and millionaire that, that something, who I'm had sorry to interrupt you, but it's like, it's something that we are seeing uh, firsthand. Our correspondents have been to Kabul and they have seen that, yeah. which basically leads me to ask you, do you think that the Taliban can actually run a country? So far, they haven't shown it. Because if you look at it, it's been four months since they took power, and the Taliban have not shown anything that shows how they would run a country. You know, they haven't put forth any specific exact laws saying this is exactly what we want. You know, they haven't set up, say, like a specific tax code. They haven't, um, they haven't made any official statements to say that these are, this is the way we envision this country. 
you know, it's been four months and I can't think of anything that they did that is a concrete example of how they want to run the country or an achievement or a step right. forward. I mean, you know, we're still using old passports from the Republic. People are still getting documents that say the Islamic Republic on top of it. Um, you know, they, they have, you know, there, there's nothing, there's no specific law. There's no, uh, there's no guidance into what they want a country to look like. Uh, we'll have to leave it there for the time being. Ali Latifi joining us from Doha with a very first person perspective. Thank you so much, Ali, for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the Taliban have done the fighting. Now they need to do the governing. And based on what Ali Latifi just said, they appear to be failing. It's something DW correspondent Nick Connolly witnessed firsthand when he was in Afghanistan in September. This is his report. With Afghanistan's foreign reserves frozen, the Taliban administration has chosen to paralyze the banking system in an attempt to stop hard currency flooding out of the country. In the process, they've brought the whole economy to a grinding halt. I'm just waiting for my salary. I don't know the future. No one is okay. Everyone is depressed here in Afghanistan. No one dares challenge them for now, but Afghanistan's new Taliban rulers know full well that tensions are rising. As ordinary Afghans' cash reserves run out, and new jobs prove almost impossible to come by. These tradesmen tell us they haven't worked in weeks. Before, I would only work as a carpenter. Now, I'll clean toilets if I have to. We might end up starving or killing ourselves, and the Taliban will cut your hand off if you steal. In a country where nearly all basic foodstuffs, from rice to oil and flour, are imported, closed banks, and currency controls mean rising prices and scarcity. And then in October, the UN said at least 14 million Afghans, that's about one third of the population, was caught on the brink of starvation. The European Union pledged 1 billion euros in aid for Afghanistan, but as the World Food Programme told me back then, promises mean nothing without follow through. What does the international community need to be doing so that you can do your job in Afghanistan? To the international community, we thank you for the pledges that you made, but we really would appreciate if the cash uh, would follow so that we could get that food into our warehouses. And since then, some cash has started to follow. France, for example, has delivered 25 million euros to the UN's World Food Program. The aid group has sent food convoys over the border from Tajikistan into Afghanistan. Russia and China have also delivered winter supplies. The United Arab Emirates has reopened its Kabul embassy. There are reports that Saudi Arabia and India intend to do the same. And China has met with the Taliban in Doha. Qatar is acting as an intermediary for other Western countries. Now, one can only imagine that efforts such as these will gather pace in the coming months. The people of Afghanistan need the world, and the world will hopefully step up. But while small steps are being taken for the people of Afghanistan, its women appear to be moving backwards. Since coming to power, the Taliban have made it nearly impossible for older girls to access education, for women to work in government jobs and be visible on TV screens. In a flash, some two decades of progress in women's rights have been lost. Now, back in September, here's how one Kabul University student described to us what she was feeling. You know, like when, when someone is dreaming for, for a better life and working for 21 years to, to, to just reach the dream, and suddenly in one night, everything just damaged. Just imagine. And now I, I myself feel like I'm in a room where only there is a darkness. No hope for a better future or no hope for a lot. This is the feeling that I really have. And joining me now for more is Nargis Nehan. She's the former Minister of Mines and Petroleum of Afghanistan. She joins me now from Oslo. Ms. Nehan, in today's Afghanistan, can women and girls be hopeful of a bright future? Um, uh, well, not at all, because you know the situation that since uh, Taliban has taken uh, control of the country, uh, the girls are not allowed to go to school. Uh, women are not allowed to go to uh, work. Uh, the women that they had business, all their business have uh, disappeared and lost. 
the women journalists and activists are not able to continue their work. So there is nothing, even a small light, would give us the hope that the situation will change. Uh, what we also see that while uh, the world has, is continuously engaging with the Taliban and is demanding uh, from the Taliban for uh, uplifting uh, their policies and coming up with moderate policies for, uh, uh, for women, but so far we don't see any change in Taliban policy. Very recently, uh, they issued a decree. The decree is just focusing on women marriage. Marriage is not the only need that women have. Women have also, for being an active part of the society, right. women need to have their free to be able to make all their choices. Uh, how would you say the world should engage with a regime that believes that women have a secondary place in society? Uh, very carefully and constructively with the Taliban, uh, especially that uh, we know that they, they, they want to take Afghanistan backward and they don't have any, they have very aggressive policies for women. So constructive diplomatic engagement is important to continue, right. to be continued then. A set of recommendations and criteria, benchmark for them to meet before their recognition, including formation of inclusive government uh, and changing their policies for women. And right. then after that, they will be able to get recognized. So I would say that the world should continue like that. And for this, their consistency, persistency, and working together with one voice is really important. We'll leave it there for the time being. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nargis Nehan.